Let's get um, into today's topic, arithmetic circuits. Um, so good news, I think it's good news, is that we're pretty much done with the sequential stuff. So all states machines and everything with the feedbacks and all that, uh, we've finished all this theory, um, we spent three weeks on this, um, and then the Verilog stuff that sort of had this in it. Um, arithmetic circuits go back into the combinational circuit. So um, no memory elements, um, whatever we get at the inputs, um, there's some combinational logic and the answer is going to come you know, a few nanoseconds later. In a way it's a bit easier, but it's a whole new topic to talk about. Now the reason um, that we talk about arithmetic circuits, arithmetic circuits, or first of all, what are arithmetic circuits? Arithmetic circuits um, are circuits that perform well arithmetic operations such as addition, subtraction, um, which is what we will cover and then obviously multiplication, division is quite tricky um, so anything arithmetic these are the kind of circuits that we will talk about we will cover in this course the addition and the subtraction which is what we'll do this week not talk too much about multiplication and division we will touch on that in 2142 next semester um, now why is it important to actually talk about these circuits? Because they're very useful. These make the building blocks into modern computers. Obviously when you run a, um, a program or when you design a computer you need what's called an ALU, um, arithmetic, arithmetic logic unit, that does the calculation or the mathematical operations for you. And it all starts with the fundamental adders and subtractors subtractors. Now um, those arithmetic circuits usually work on um, binary input vectors so obviously you don't want to just add and subtract one bit you have a whole number made of I don't know 8 bits, 16 bits and so on and you want to do some operation between them. Now in general it's usually true to think about these circuits um, as an iterative um, circuit. What does that mean? That means that when you have a vector of bits, the operation between any two corresponding bits will probably be the same throughout the vector. So it's usually enough to come up with a circuit for one bit. You're not going to start it, are you? No, not you, behind you. For a change. Um, so what we'll do, we'll usually design a circuit that will do the very basic operation on one bit and then duplicate the circuit for as many bits as we need. So for example, have a look at this circuit there. Um, imagine we have two, um, two numbers A and B and let's say we have just for example sake A2, A1 <laughs> then B3, B2, B1, B0 and we're going to have some operation on them and we'll get a result C3, C2, C1, C0. So on every two corresponding bits, so for example <coughs> A0 and B0, we can do the operation on that using a cell and get the result for that particular bit and then we can take the same cell and duplicate it a um, few times in order to cover the number of bits that we need. Now there may need to be some communication between those blocks and these are the X and Y um, signals going between the cells depending on what we're trying to do. Um, we will talk specifically about um, adders, and, adders and subtractors but this is true for um, other types of arithmetic operations as well. Now the reason why we actually take this approach is if you try to take the regular approach um, is there a humming sound coming from somewhere? Is it from the outside? Hey? Is it? Um, I think I know how to fix this. Um, Bonus. 
Um, if we try the regular approach, and let's take as an example that the numbers are each 32 bits, then we end up with two numbers of 32 bits, 64 different inputs to our circuit, and the result will be a 32 bits result, so 32 um, outputs from the circuit. If you try to think about it as a regular combination of logic, um, in the way to build a truth table, then 64 inputs mean 2 to the power of 64 um, different input combinations, they will have um, 32 different output functions. That's a lot of rows in the truth table. Good luck writing that one out and coming up with, well, corner maps for this. Not going to happen. Therefore, um, it's actually better to design a bit by bit or one cell uh, per bit and then try to connect them together. You might not get the most optimized circuit, but you will save yourself a whole lot of work. And we're talking about a whole lot of work. Okay. We'll start off with um, talking about binary headers, very common. Now, when you want to add two binary numbers, it's essentially the same way as you would have done it in um, decimal. Let's take a decimal case. Let's have a look at this example here. If I ask you to add those two numbers together with long addition, you would do 7 plus 6, 13, so we'll get a 3, carry a 1, and then 1 plus 7 is 8, plus 8, 16, and you end up with 163. I hope everybody knows how to do long addition. I really hope so. And we'll get to long subtraction in the next hour. It's going to be even funner. Same idea with um, binary, um, with the carry and everything. Only you have to keep in mind, we only have two um, digits, other zero and a one. Once you go over a one, you start carrying things. For example, if you had to add one plus zero, you end up with a one, no problem there. Zero plus one is a one. Then when you do a one plus one, you get a two. A two in binary will be a zero and a carry of one. Very similar to what you would have done in decimal if you have a number that's 10 or above. You carry um, the one, and then you do one plus one. Again, a two, so it's a zero. Carry one, one plus zero plus one is a two, so zero, carry one. Then no problem there. We just and then no carry coming from here. One plus one is two. Carry one. And then we have the one. And hopefully this is the same result as this one. They're supposed to be the same numbers. They are indeed the same numbers. All right. Um, by the way, I tend to make a lot of mistakes when I do these lectures. If you see any problems with my mathematics, please raise your hand and correct me before I move on and make a total fool of myself. Cool. Um, all right, so that's how you add two binary numbers, very similar to um, decimal. And now let me introduce to you the very fundamental circuit um, of the adders, the half adder. Half adder is defined as a circuit that adds um, the sum of two bits. So you have um, sort of two, operation, um, two operands A and B. We just want to add them together. Each one of them is one bit. We might end up with zero plus zero, which will give us a zero, or zero plus one, or one plus zero, or one plus one. 1 plus 1, we said, will give us a 2, which is essentially a 0 and a carry of 1. So we'll actually write, um, to generalize these, um, these uh, equations that I just wrote here, as a sum of x plus y, which will give me the sum and the carry. So s will stand for sum, c stands for carry. And just um, to make everything consistent with the first three, I will put carries.
x not y or um, not x y that's for, c, uh, that's for s and then for c it's just going to be x and y clearly when you see this structure you immediately think hold on that's an x or gate um, it goes without saying so straight away this becomes um, x and x x or y <coughs> and then from these equations we can come up with the half eta circuit equations corresponding circuit so this circuit remember what I said enough half eta half eta was it takes two bits x and y add them together to produce the sum and possible carry um, from this addition. Very useful circuit, isn't it? The answer is no. Not quite. Alright, let's expand on this and define a full adder. So the full adder is similar to the half adder, only now it will also take into account a possible carry in bit from another stage. And this is when we start developing um, the cells to produce a larger adders. We will now produce um, a cell that is able to take a carry in from a stage on the right, calculate the sum of the two current bits A, B plus possible carry in, and then produce a carry out and a sum from that particular stage. So in a similar process to what we've done before, um, I have all these different options that I can add. So I have the two um, x and y's, x and y, and I have a carry in. in the, um, for now, we'll call it z. That can either be a carry in of zero or a carry in of one, and I will produce again the sum and the carry out. Essentially, what I'm doing, I'm adding three bits together. So in the two extremes. I can either add 0 plus 0 plus 0, which will give me um, 0, or I can add 1 plus 1 plus 1, which will give me 3. Either case, 0 to 3, I can express um, in two bits. So I don't need any extra bits um, at the output. I'm still good with the sum and the carry out. <coughs> now, again, I want to take this and produce a circuit from it. Um, this truth table just repeats exactly what um, I had in the previous slide and I've already done the quantum maps for you because by week 9 you don't need any more practice with quantum maps and we can see the equations are much much um, more complicated than what we had uh, for the half error but it's slightly more useful as well Now the question is, can we now take these equations, which is a two-level um, implementation, and try to optimize them a little bit better so we don't end up with so many gates and so much complexity? And when I say, can we do this, then you can always assume, yes, we can, because you know, I wouldn't ask otherwise. So some of the things we might want to try to do is, let's take... Um, the S here, I will try to factorize, let's say, um, the Z out and the node Z out. I'll start with the node Z terms. So I have node Z, node X, Y, or X, node Y, and you can see where this is going, or the Z, which is the first and the fourth terms, and I'll have not x, not y, or x, y. Clearly, um, this one there is an x or already. We can see that. So we will have not z, x, x or y. <coughs> What's this one? X nor. Yeah. So that's another structure that's really good um, if you can recognize straight away. Um, and then we'll have or Z 
x, x nor y. Which now, if you look at this whole thing, becomes another x or on its own because we have um, not something um, and the true value or let's say not a b or a not b. So this can become an x or on its own which will make it um, x, x or y, x or z. If you want to see it nicely, so we had this term there, x or with the z. And um, if you remember when we talked about the x or function, I said x or is um, only defined to be work um, to operate on two inputs. When we have more than two inputs, it becomes the odd function, which tells you how many odd numbers of ones or rather if you have an odd number of ones in your function. And this is, um, this is, I don't know if you can recognize it very quickly, but when you have things that are diagonal like this, it sometimes imply a possible odd function and in fact you can see that if you look at all the combinations, um, we do have ones in all the places where we have an odd number of ones. So in here for example, the combination is 0, 0, 1, which is an odd number of 1's. Again, odd number of 1's here, odd number of 1's here. Um, in this particular one, the green, by the way, is a combination of 1, 1, and 1, so 3 1's, it's odd. Um, and an odd function is like a big XOR function. If you didn't see that, when you looked at this, the manipulation here will bring it um, on its own. I can do some more manipulation on um, the C, the carry, and I will take the Z out um, here as well. So I'll have X, Y, or Z, X, or Y. Now I'll do something um, a bit naughty. If you remember, tutorial 2, question 16. <laughs> we proved the fact that x or y is the same as x y or x x or y. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. No. You should remember this. As I said, this this proof came up in um, 2009 exam. Um, although they didn't they didn't need to remember it. I gave it to them and I said prove it, which is not that difficult. But I can use this property here and then replace this x or y with this expression and how is this going to help me? Well, let's see, so I'm going to have z x y or x x or y. Now <laughs> I'll try to skip a step. Can you see why I can get rid of this term here? If I take, if I multiply it out, I'm going to have x, y, z, which is already contained in this x, y term here. If you really want to see it happening, then you can factorize out x, y and have 1 or z. 1 or anything is a 1. It can disappear. Therefore, I will end up with x, y, or z, x, x, or y. Why did I want to do this manipulation? Because when I calculated the sum, I already had to calculate x, x or y, and then I can reuse this result from there um, in the gate here. So it saves me a few gates because um, I will always have the s and the c together in the same circuit. Um, I do want to reuse the calculations if possible. Now one thing that 
I'm sort of going to show you later. I will give names to this term here, xy, and to this xoy here. I will call this term here generate and I will call this term here propagate and it will become apparent why I'm giving them those names very very soon so back to what we were actually trying to achieve we try to come up with a circuit that implements a full header which means it takes three bits as inputs and calculate the sum and the carry at the output the three bits are x, y and z the two outputs are s and c, sum and carry I can take these equations that I just derived and this is the corresponding circuit as you can see this is my x or that calculates the x, x or y and we're using it both in the S equation and then later um, in the C equation through this um, end gate. And it sort of starts becoming more apparent why do we call them half adder and full adder? Because if you sort of observe this circuit, you realize that you actually have two half adders. right there so half header another half header two halves gives you a full yeah so this is where the naming come from half header um, and a full header now going back to the bigger picture why did we come up with this because we want to end up with an header circuit that can um, that is able to add a number of um, two numbers that are given as binary vectors and this is going to be one cell or you might hear the term bit slice so one bit slice of the adder that can add two vectors together and it sort of becomes more apparent now how are we going to go about doing this because this circuit takes in a carry in from another stage calculate the sum and throw in a carry out that will be connected to the next stage and this is what we will call a binary ripple carry adder and I'll show you the um, schematics for this in a second but the idea is that for an n number of bits so if you have a 8 bits um, number, so two 8 bit numbers you want to cascade or connect together 8 of those um, cells in a way that each carry out from one cell will be an input to the next cell and this is how the diagram is going to look like now when I, just, just a little thing about notation when I derived the um, half header and the full headers I used x, y and z so um, sort of generic um, signal names now we'll start using A, B, and C, and S, where A and B will usually be the two numbers that I'm trying to add together. Um, C will be the carry, either carry in or carry out, and the S will be um, the sum. Let's see an example of what's going to happen here. Well there is going to be some initial carry coming into the circuit because it takes each one of these um, cells is identical to the next so the rightmost cell here takes some um, carry in but because there's no carry in coming from the outside we will set C0 to B0 so no carry coming into our others we will put in two numbers um, in this example here it's two four bit numbers so A3 down to A0 and B3 down to A0 sorry down to B0 and each one of those stages will now calculate um, A0 
plus B0, so it's a full error. With carrying of 0, we'll put in um, C0 <coughs> equals 0. And then it may or may not generate a carry out that will be fed into the next stage. If you want to look at it as an example here, well, C0, which is here, the I's here, by the way, stand for the index of um, the bit position. We'll have carrying of 0 plus 1 plus 1 which will be 2, which is 0, and a carry 1. This carry will be carried here. So this CI plus 1 is the same as this CI. 1 plus 1 plus 1 will be a 1 and a carry 1, which will be carried here. 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1 carry 0, which will be carried here. 0 plus 1 plus 0 is 1 carry 0, and that zero here, which I sort of carried there, is what I will get out from my circuit altogether. My C4 will be this sort of carry that goes nowhere, just being um, pushed out. Is this clear to everyone? Yes? then it falls off the edge there and we don't know about this for now I mean this circuit it, it doesn't speculate anything it does exactly what the circuit's supposed to do um, C4 will be asserted 1 and if you're not connected to anything it'll just be there um, Duncan can you please close the door because I'm getting a lot of noise Dick. Huh? Dick? Dick? Sorry Dean? Deacon. Deacon. How many times did I get it wrong? Only three. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. All right. Um, back to this. Is this concept clear? If it's clear, it's really good news because this is the fundamental. Um, circuit in um, LUs. However, here's a problem with this. When we use um, ripple um, carry adders, the um, carry path needs to go through all those different gates, through all the different um, cells, until the final result um, is stabilized. Now, if we go back to our circuit here and this is one um, stage of the adder if we have a carry in coming from Z then in order to get to the carry out you will need to go through this gate here followed by this gate here and this carry out will then be pushed into the next stage again go through two gates as well now each one of those gates might have some gate delay associated with it we said in real world um, the gates are not optimal they're not ideal there is some propagation delay through the gates so the more stages you add to this adder the more bits you add to it the more gate delays you actually add in the path it's not a problem um, for the sum by the way because the sum always just takes um, the X and the Y uh, straight away and the carry um, from the previous stage but this will um, be evaluated before the carry out will so the crucial path the longest path will be through the carry and to show you how much of a problem it is then think about if we want to add two 16-bit numbers. We said each stage will have two gate delays associated with it. So um, 16 of those cells times 2 is 32 gate delays plus a little bit of overhead. There isn't actually an extra gate in the first stage. 32 gate delays is unacceptable usually. 
if you want to compare with something, we up until now optimized all of our circuits using Karnamet in two level, um, two level structures. So we always at most had two gate delays. All of a sudden you introduce um, a circuit with 32 gate delays, um, no way this is going to work. This will now be uh, the bottleneck in your system. And you must have, you must carry, uh, you must wait for the carry to propagate all the way through until you're um, certain that the sum of the two numbers is correct. Question? Yeah. Um, if that's a 16, uh, you've got 32 gate delays because the carry goes through those two now. Yeah. But the first input of the gate comes out of another gate. So wouldn't that be three? The first... If you go back to the diagram, yeah. The first AND gate of the... This gate. one? No, to the right one. I mean, this one or the next, yeah. this one? Yeah. yeah. It's coming from here. Yeah. That's why I said that there will be an extra one at the first stage. Yeah. But um, what you need to remember: all those x and y's yeah. are being applied in parallel together. So, in the first gate delay, for all the different stages, um, this path here will be evaluated and will wait for the carry to come in. So this is one gate delay where all the different, all the 16 stages, this path in circle will already be calculated because X and Y are available all at the same time. And it will now wait for the carry to propagate through all the different stages. Does that, you don't, you don't seem pleased. I don't buy it. You don't buy it. Okay. I don't understand why you have 32 and not either 48 or 16. So you've got one extra gate delay from this circuit or you've got the whole three of them, I understand why it's just two. Okay. The critical path, yeah. the longest path in the circuit, yeah. will be, and I'll make a statement and then I'll try to explain it, will be uh, the path through the carry. So the carry coming in yeah. and then going out. And again, this is the statement before the explanation. You, you can be convinced that this path through here goes through two gates. But you're saying for this gate here, we also need this signal to actually calculate it. So um, this will be another gate that we have to wait for. Now what happens, forget this path there, right? Imagine we have 16 of these run next to each other. And we apply all the X and Ys for all the different stages at the same time, right? The two A and B numbers are all are being put in parallel. So that XOR gate, or all, and, and when I say that one, I mean this one here, it will take one gate delay, um, but all the 16 will be done in parallel in the first gate delay, right? In the first, let's say, 10 nanoseconds, let's say this is the gate delay. In the first 10 nanoseconds, all 16 stages will have this signal already available and settled to the right, um, to the right value. Do you agree with me? Okay. Okay. Now you get it? All right. Um, other questions? And this is why, by the way, the first stage, this is the overhead part that I was talking about. Um, somewhere. This is that overhead, that one extra gate delay that's only crucial in the first um, in the first step because we do have to wait for it but once it's done it's done for all of them in parallel how do we solve this put a what all right, the buffer. On all the X, Ys. There. Yeah. Okay. How, how is a buffer going to fit? A buffer will, in fact, add more propagation delay. Right? Um, there's, um, all right, Deacon? If you use serial inputs and outputs, you just use a single letter to You can iterate them, yes. Um, um, but that, that will optimize the the size, so you only need one full adder, but it will take a whole lot longer. 
because you do one operation then you repeat this and then it comes down to um, and this is by the way part of where this assignment that I'm giving you is going to how do you know how long it takes the inputs to actually settle before you can uh, put it back in now you can't just connect the outputs to the inputs because um, it'll sort of go through but then when, when do you stop it? When, when's the final answer? because you can you know it can keep iterating and you want to put new inputs in as well um, and in the assignment by the way we will implement this using asynchronous method they will actually have some um, circuit that detects when the outputs have been settled and therefore can push a new input without a clock um, just a little bit something slightly outside of the scope but because um, it was brought up what we can do which is similar to the idea where you said yeah, let's put a buffer in is to put flip-flops at the beginning and then start clocking this um, this circuit essentially the idea in that case um, and by the way you don't have to know about this but this is actually interesting and it's really and it's real this is what we do um, is what we call pipeline the the adder path pipelining mean we will put uh, flip-flops at the inputs and at the outputs and that way we can start pushing um, do several operations at once where every time we clock it we sort of let it propagate one stage um, further inside the, um, the adder the result from this by the way will not actually give you a quicker evaluation of the actual sum because it, if anything it will give you a slower one because um, your clock needs to be at least as fast as or at least as slow as um, the critical path through this um, circuit there but it will give you the option to start doing a whole lot of calculations one after the other um, on a whole lot of numbers the end result is that um, you will get the output a little bit later from um, this fast circuit but you will get a whole lot more outputs um, in the same time so you sacrifice what we call the latency so you add more delay but you do do uh, quicker operations or more operations using the same circuitry um, and obviously you have to add in the flip-flops which means more gates and if this really confused you right now really don't worry about this um, if you if you are interested in this by the way this these are the kind of stuff we talk about in um, 4601 it's a fourth year elective and we show how to pipeline circuits, how to break them, where to break them, and how to calculate the best possible way to do it. Something to look forward to. And a whole lot of very login as well. Bless you. Okay. Um, so let's do try to solve this um, problem because you know really long um, gate delay is not quite an option. Now if we said this was a ripple carry headers, let me introduce to you the carry look ahead headers. The idea, I'll give you the main idea before, is that we can predict what the carry from previous stages will be very, very quickly, and then we don't have to worry about the carry propagating through the whole thing. Now when I say predict, it sounds a bit mystical. Um, we don't really predict it, we calculate it at um, the expense of more logic in our circuit. Now let's see what's the idea behind this. Do you remember before when I called the two signals generate and propagate? This is where they come um, into play. I will define, and you'll see why in a second, the generate signal to be A and B, the propagate signal to be A, X or B. Now, generate comes in from um, the fact that we have to generate a carry whenever both A and B are one. Regardless of what carry came in from before, for, for example, take this case here, both A and B are one, I know for sure that I will have a carry out, regardless if the carry in was a zero or one. The carry in will then influence what the sum will be, if it's a carrying of zero, the sum will be zero. And if it's a carrying of one, the sum will be one. But the carry out will have to be one regardless. So this is why I call it generate. 
if A and B are one, generate a carry regardless of what happens in the previous ones. The other definition, propagate, um, and this is an XOR. XOR means either A is one or B is one, not both of them at the same time. And this will tell me if this is the case, that only one of them is one, the carry out will be, will follow the very same as the carry coming in. Or propagate the carry that came in to the next stage. And again, you can look at um, an example here where um, only one of them is one. If the carry in is a one, then we have um, a one plus one. Forget the sum, but the carry out will be that one that came in. If the carry in was a zero, we'll have a zero plus zero plus zero, and therefore we will not have a carry out. So I know that if one of them is a one, so A, X, or B, whatever the carry in, I will just push it straight into um, the carry out. The sum is a whole different story, but I have no problem with the sum. The sum I can calculate really, really quickly. It's the carry path that I want to optimize. And this is where um, the naming generate and propagate come from. So far we are clear on what's going on, why generate, why propagate? Now another thing to notice, those signals here, and I, and I will use them in a second, both of them only require one gate delay to um, calculate. This will be an AND gate at the top, this will be an XOR gate, each one of them will require one gate delay, delay um, to, um, to calculate. Now how can I use this? Well, if you remember the equations for S and for um, carry out, I can now rewrite them in terms of the propagate and the generate signals. So the propagate was defined as A, X or B. So we'll replace that with the propagate, X or the carry in from the previous stage. So far we haven't actually quite optimized it yet. We still have to wait for the carry in. Um, the carry out, this was the original equation. This we define as a generate, so G. Or A, X or B is the propagate ended with the carry in that came in. Again, I did not optimize anything just yet. I just rewrote um, these equations using the generate and propagate um, signals. And when you look at these equations, for example, if you look at here, it kind of makes sense. It's, it follows exactly the definition because I'm saying I will generate a carry or um, I will propagate the carry that came in from a previous stage. So if generate is one, the carry out will be one. If propagate is one, then carry out will be equal to the carry in. So it all sort of makes sense. And now the fun begins. I want to be able, this is the carry out, I'm just rewriting the equation from before. It was uh, the generate signal or the propagate ended with the carrying to this stage. Let's put some real numbers into them. I want to know C1, so the carry out from stage 0 will equal, well, um, generate 0. I'm just putting in numbers into this equation there. Or propagate 0, C0. C0, if you remember, is an external signal that came together um, with my two numbers, A and B. And P0 and G0, the propagate and generate, are the signals that I can um, calculate using one gate delay um, as I showed you before. Now if I want to write the next stage, C2, it will be G1 or P1, C1. Nothing special here. But hold on, I know what C1 is. So I can actually replace this with 
this expression here. So we'll get G0 or P1, P0, C0. Yeah? Nothing dodgy so far? Continuing the same logic, C3 will be G2 or <coughs> P2, C2. I know what carry 2 is. It's this thing here. And I will write it as G2 or P2, P1, G0 or P2, um, P1, P0, C0. Welcome. Both of you. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Which one did I forget? The. Oh, yeah. I'll try to push it in. This will be G2 or P2, G1. Yeah? And then just to finish it off, in the, this is a 4 bit carry look ahead, so I'm going to have um, up to C4. This will be G3 or P3, C3, which will now be G3 or P3, G2, P3, P2. <laughs> Uh, hold on. This one was for this one. P two G one. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So I was here. P three P two P one G zero or P three. P2, P1, P0, C0. Yes? Sweet. And so on and so on if you have more stages, right? Now, what do I gain out of this? If I express the carries um, in that way, then I'm only relying on the propagates and the generates and C0, I don't need to wait for any of the carries to come in from previous stages because I can calculate my P's and my G's in one gate delay, right? We showed it before. My C0 is already available from the outside um, world. This is an external signal. And now this whole thing, let's say, let's take C4, will require the two gate delays for um, one gate delay will be the end terms here, so each one of them will be an end gate. The second gate delay will be an OR, they will OR all of these together, so that's two gate delays, plus another gate delay to calculate the P's and the G's. So in theory, I can get away with three gate delays, for this kind of error, regardless of the number of bits that I have in my error. Now, that's obviously a good improvement from 32 gate delays. I'm going down to 3. But why in theory? Because we know that we in practice cannot go to any number of um, gate inputs that we want. There's a limit to inputs we can have to one gate. And then what we, um, what we do end up doing is make four bits carry look at headers, which is what we've done now, which we can actually get away with, and then cascade them together, uh, well, either cascade them together or um, generate another group carry, um, carry look ahead um, circuitry, which I will not um, get into. But it's the same idea of the generate and propagate, only for the whole group. So it does add a little bit more um, gates or more gate delays, but we're still far, from away, far, far away from those 32 gate delays that we were trying to avoid before.
Um, all right. Let's take a break here. Um, ten minutes break, and we'll continue then.